Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Check Ready Grow 2020. This is our third webinar. And we thank you very much for making the time and the effort to, uh, to attend today. Today's webinar will also be, um, be recorded and put up on our website for folk that couldn't make the 12 o'clock time slot uh, to watch a little bit later. So first, first of all, I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Camilleroy people, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and those emerging. Okay, so you're all on mute, um, but you can ask a question with the dialogue box. Leonie's just put up a quick poll that we're trying to figure out where folk are from. Um, if you could answer that quick poll for us, that would be really good, thank you. Okay, there's a um, quick and easy uh, exit survey at the end of today's session, and uh, we'd like you to consider filling that out for us so that we can better target your needs moving, um, moving forward. Okay, so we'll be asking um, some simple poll questions as we go through as well. Um, but also, if we can hold the uh, the questions that you're um, you're thinking about towards the end of the uh, the presentation, that'd be great. We've got a fair bit to get through, and you'll see that um, on the um, the screen there now you've got navigating the go to platform, and you'll see down the bottom there is enter a question for staff down there. And up the top, you've got the uh, hide show control panel, that little um, orange arrow. We'll just put that box away on your screen. Okay, so today, um, we're looking at challenges in your business, uh, managing risk, and the role of local land services. So um, I'll cover a little bit at the end of the webinar today, looking at, once again, our grant funding opportunities. And certainly I'd like to um, acknowledge the people that have been integral in, in getting this production up and running. Our LLS team, Northwest Local Land Services, um, the NRM team, Natural Resource Management, the Ag Advisory Group, the Regional Agricultural Land Holder Facilitators, uh, Land Care Facilitators, and um, certainly Beck Feng, from um, the House Paddock Training and Consultancy. And she is amazing with what she does with all our, our webinars. And um, thank you very much, Beck. And once again, welcome to our third webinar. So it's great to see how many people have come in from uh, different areas. And without any further ado, we've got a stack to get through today. I'll hand straight across to Beck and um, and take it away. Thanks, Beck. Thank you very much, Keith, and thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, and thank you to Local Land Services for having me. Um, I have really enjoyed the last couple of webinars and working with uh, Keith and Leonie and Michelle on pulling um, them together, uh, and also um, using the feedback that we've been getting along the way to make sure we're presenting content that's relevant to you as, as landholders and landholders in the Northwest. So, which is nice to see that's where majority of people are dialing in from. Um, the idea of this series is to provide you with a framework uh, and I guess a roadmap or a direction of the overall um, aim of your business and the goals of your business. What values help frame up your uh, decisions? So you might be able to consider some of the opportunities that the local land services team uh, have available to you um, and put some more constructive thought um, into where you might be able to utilise some of those opportunities. So as Keith said, this is the third of a final module uh, and webinar that we're presenting as part of the Check Ready Grow program. And today we're talking all things risk management. So we operate in a unique environment in farming where majority or a lot of the risks that we uh, face and manage are completely out of our control. So uh, we're potentially in a lot of instances um, up against it. 
Again, there'll be a workbook um, that will come your way on um, on the email. It's a, it's actually a cracker. This one, um, I well, I hope the last couple were useful, but um, this actually provides an opportunity for you to um, really consider the risks in your business. Um, have a think about. Uh, how you might be able to manage or mitigate those risks. But also there's another couple of elements that we're going to discuss today that that, um, that workbook will allow you to, to reflect on. Um, so without spending a lot of time recapping, um, we have had a discussion around our business vision, our values, goals, our legacy, and our overall business direction. And then how to think about um, some of that strategy component, so goal setting and planning. So the next part of the, the pie or the puzzle or whatever you might call it, a business plan, is um, actually consideration uh, of risk, which is what we're um, here to talk about today. So um, we often think of risk uh, in, in quite, with quite a negative connotation. And it's at this point that I'd like to suggest that while um, it is uh, perceived to be leading um, to negative or undesirable outcomes, it's also important at this point to note that risk really can provide um, opportunities for positive um, benefits and beneficial outcomes to your business. So we're gonna talk about risk capacity and risk tolerance um, and risk management and mitigation. So we can um, obviously offset or prevent the more negative um, potential of the risk, but also allow um, some of the more positive risks to enter our business and allow us to materialize um, those opportunities. So. What are we going to cover? Um, we're going to define risk, what is it? And also have a look at what risks um, could impact, impact your farming business. Um, we're going to talk about why it's critically important to manage risk. Um, talking about the risk capacity of your business, how uh, tolerant is your business um, to risk? Uh, how do we identify them? Once we have identified a risk, what do we do about them? But then also having a look at the individuals in our uh, business, the decision makers, and how the impact of their perception of risk and their tolerance, individual and personal tolerance of risk, comes together with the capacity of our business um, to really understand um, the overall risk and what exists. So um, let's make a bit of a start. Uh, by definition, what is, is risk? Um, if we go back to about uh, grade six or seven, and we would have talked about chance um, and risk uh, in maths at school with some counters and dice and coins and, um, you know, flipping the coins and seeing um, around probability. So uh, the first part of risk is understanding the prob probability um, of an event. So uh, how often uh, or how likely is something to happen? Uh, and then after we've identified um, the, the probability is having a look at the impact. So um, if it does go wrong or it does actually happen, what is the impact on our business? Is it catastrophic? Is it negative? Is it marginal? So there's, there's two components of risk. So understanding um, the occurrence um, and then also the severity um, of the risk. So, but then risk management focuses on identifying um, an evaluation, but also um, implementing strategies to deal with um, manage or mitigate risk. Um, so once we have identified the risks that impact our business, we do have potential um, to be prepared to deal with them as they come along um, and also making sure we're dealing that, with that in a cost-effective um, and productive manner. So why is it important for us to manage risk? Well, um, we often uh, talk informally and analyse uh, risk and evaluate it. But the most um, critical part for managing um, a successful farming business is actually the mitigation process. So making sure we have strategies in place if a risk does occur that we can do something about it. And again, um, mentioning that um, effective risk management can really help us ensure that we have positives and um, positive outcomes um, can be achieved, but also the, um, the extent of the losses can be um, avoided. The other thing, and when we talk about um, the individual tolerance um, of the decision makers, is are we positioned to be able to capitalise on an opportunity and capture those as they as they come along? And what is the, uh, if it's not a certain outcome, uh, what is the potential impact of that um, on our business? So 
a part of this is actually um, understanding um, a risk management process. So this is where we need to methodically identify the risks that um, could occur in our business uh, associated with the relevant activities that we're engaging in. Um, again, looking at that likelihood, how likely um, is this to um, occur? And then once we um, understand the likelihood, um, do we have a response in place? How are we going to respond to these uh, the risks and, and the impacts? And then also, uh, what is the washout of the consequence? What systems can we put in place to deal with consequences. Um, once we've got that side of things organised, um, we can have a look at the effectiveness of our risk management approaches and controls by assessing the genuine, um, measuring the genuine impact that that particular risk has had um, and uh, go forward to see if it's adequate. So there's a lot of things in there that we're gonna go on and talk about. So we keep talking about what are the risks, we're gonna talk about those and then have a think about how we can put those um, those strategies in place. So where do we start? Um, I think the best place to start is understanding the risk capacity of your business. So this is the business's ability um, to incur a risk. So if we have a business um, that has a low risk capacity, this is where we need to be really careful of incurring any further risk. And I would suggest that we have some businesses after a prolonged period of drought or that have been imp impacted um, by a bushfire potentially. Um, I would say small businesses in our communities uh, have been, who have been impacted by, um, by COVID-19 would be um, potentially in a low risk capacity um, setting at the moment where um, we can't really afford to incur a lot of losses in the immediate short term. Uh, because the impact of some of uh, on our business to date has been quite high. Then we have those businesses that are in a bit of a medium um, risk capacity. I'm going to explain to you how we can actually um, uh, determine where we fit from a risk capacity perspective. Risk capacity means that we're not badly positioned. We could incur a risk if we had to, but we also don't want to put ourselves out um, out too far. I go back to one of the earlier slides where I had the picture of the turtle. Um, because if you're a risky person, you may um, appreciate the, the comment, if you're a particularly risk tolerant person, um, you know, to behold the turtle, he only gets ahead when he sticks his neck out. So I guess this um, looking at risk capacity of your business is seeing how far you can stick your neck out, seeing how far out on a limb um, you already are, or have you wound yourself back in? Have you put some measures in place that your business isn't badly positioned um, and you might have a high risk capacity where you're in a really good, um, a good position to incur risk into the future and it won't necessarily have too much of a, a negative impact on your business. Or even if it does have a negative impact, um, the business can withstand, uh, withstand it. So I'll give you some examples here of where a business might be either a low or a higher risk capacity um, look, using four different indicators. So one of the indicators we can use is our equity base. So we're looking there at the debt level um, relative to our asset base. If you have a really high debt uh, and your asset base is, is low, so you have low equity, that would put you in a category of debt having a pretty low risk capacity, which makes sense. The flip side of that is if you had a really uh, great equity in your business, low um, debt base, you potentially um, could see you in a high risk capacity. Um, what about uh, farm reserves or off-farm assets? So financial reserves rather and off-farm assets. So if, you, uh, if you've got all of your eggs in one basket, potentially that's gonna to lend towards that lower risk capacity where we really do need to protect the eggs that we've got. And we might be looking for smaller incremental changes along the way, as opposed to, look, this could propel us forward and we can wear the loss, if that makes sense. Similarly, um, or uh, on the contrary, if you have large reserves, financial reserves, um, and or some significant and substantial off-farm um, assets and investments, we don't have all the eggs in, in the one basket anymore. So that way, that's where in maybe your farming um, business or one of your businesses, you can potentially um, uh, take some risk and the other um, elements of your business may well be able to offset uh, that risk. Similarly, um, looking at uh, off-farm income can potentially impact your businesses risk capacity, but also can um, our income. So again, um, back in, I think, 
mod the second webinar, we talked about the um, circles of influence and circles of control and touched on the fact that in farming, um, we really do, there's some elements of our business that have a huge impact that, um, that we don't have a lot of control over. And the drought's been a great example of that, where even our best producers found ourselves back over in this category where uh, we may have borrowed against our equity to sustain um, business operations. Um, we might have had sell off farm assets. Our cash reserves were definitely compromised. Um, and also our income at that point, more than variable and volatile, it was non-existent. So um, a good example there where our um, one of the risks that can impact our business is completely out of our control. And that's that of, um, of climatic risk. So um, yeah, look, farming is an example of where we do potentially have a, a volatile income base and um, when there are industries that are a little bit more consistent. So in a production based industry, so factory based industry or a lot of service based industries where we we might have peaks and fogs in our um, in our income, but the volatility, uh, it's definitely not an all on or all off. Or if it is, the predictability is there and we can manage against those. So. What can we do as business owners and managers to um, improve our risk capacity? Some of these are going to be blatantly obvious, guys, and they're, I'm pretty confident anyone who um, is doing their darndest in the farming business across the Northwest um, is engaging in some of these strategies, or if they're not engaging in them, they'd love to be engaged in them, and it's circumstantial uh, is the reason why they're not. But let's have a quick look at them. So we can obviously work towards reducing business debt and increasing the equity um, in our business. If possible, financial reserves are obviously um, you know, stacked away for a rainy day, or in our case, a wet day, but a dry day. Um, can we change the mix of enterprises in our business um, to secure um, that, uh, like to uh, result in some security and um, mitigate or manage against the volatility um, if there's, um, we're going to talk about, say, market volatility and the market risk that exists um, in a moment. But is there something that you can do? Is it around forward selling? Is it uh, around a, a varied um, arrangement of enterprises on your business so you can actually manage some of that income volatility in your business? Um, we often see that um, businesses have diversified and have um, might have some farming or grazing country in different catchment areas, different um, rainfall zones, different climatic areas. So um, you can, you know, usually sometimes if one area is not necessarily doing so well, the other one might be able to offset um, that risk. Also making sure that we are analysing um, our cost of production and our operational overheads and doing our best to reduce any losses to operate um, in a financially efficient fashion and improve our profit margins for our business. And look, again, um, things have been really tough and I'm pretty confident that a lot of the businesses that are listening in are doing just that. Um, we're gonna talk about insurance as well, and it's not necessarily the only answer um, to a risk, but once we have put a risk mitigation strategy uh, in place and we ascertain that our business could be put on its knees, uh, through something that's out of our control, potentially this is where insurance comes in um, into play. So um, lots of different um, opportunities to investigate the appropriate insurance for your business. But for a lot of businesses, it's definitely not the only part, but an important part um, of improving this uh, capacity and a risk management strategy. Um, we're going to talk about human risk. So that's where we, um, we might be involved in uh, a corporate agricultural business, it might be a multi-generational farming, a uh, family farming business. And it's really important at this point that we understand um, who's at the table, who's making decisions, and also uh, what their long-term goals are, because we can have a real risk and we've seen it. We would have seen it in our communities, maybe our families, in our neighbourhoods, where someone has popped up and said, hey, I've been here 25 years, I'm out. And the risk, if we're, um, if our risk tolerance or capacity, sorry, of our business is low, we might have the financial viability to allow that person to exit without sale of the business. And we do see that um, happen all the time, sadly. So we're going to talk about some of those strategies as well. Um, again, um, making sure that through open communication and looking after ourselves and managing our own um, mental and physical health and wellbeing, we're going to be better equipped to uh, manage the risk of our business. So um, and I'm talking their physical and mental fatigue, 
Um, I'm talking about um, really valuable relationships and that piece around communicating effectively. So everyone, remember the, the track that I talked about being on the same bus? Well, we're going to talk about the impact of different um, risk tolerances of individuals and how that can cause conflict um, in a business. So um, some strategies there, like I said, that's nothing that's groundbreaking. You're potentially across and working towards some of these things, but there might be something on that list that goes, you go, hey, hang on, I could probably put a little bit of uh, energy uh, into that area and improve our risk capacity of our business, even just slightly incremental improvements, remember, across the course of time can add up and make a difference. So let's go back a step and have a think about what exists and what risks exist in our business. Um, and then, but also what's the process of identifying them? So if you um, don't or haven't been down the path of identifying risks in your business, here's a bit of a, um, a guide of how you might be able to do that. Um, if you think about a risk, it's anything that can have a negative or potentially a positive, but let's focus on that negative from a, a negative impact um, to might be your profitability, your productivity, your sustainability of, of the business. So what we need to have a look at is the actual business itself and do a, uh, itself and do an assessment there and consider is it uh, is it assets, is it resources, is it activities, is it personnel? What components of your business are critical in the success of that triple bottom line in the productivity of your business, the sustainability, the profitability? What elements of your business um, are most critical? And then the next question, which is quite a simple question, is what is it that can affect them? So, and I'm going to talk about um, some of the things that can affect them when we list our risks in a moment. But what is it that can affect the critical elements of our business? What can affect our production system? What can affect our, our personnel? What is it that can affect our services or our resources? And once we um, have done an assessment, and I, I encourage you to do this, even just by mapping out your year, what is it that happens uh, seasonally, annually, monthly, weekly? Uh, who's involved? What's involved? Um, and then um, what has an impact there? So we can have a look at the critical elements and the impact in one hit. The other way we can assess the risks um, in our business is to have a think about the past. So what are some of the adverse, um, uh, I guess, happenings that have affected your business in the past? Um, and also, um, we always say that you can't, um, you can't manage until you've measured. And quite often, we don't necessarily um, have a strong handle on the measurement. And so our management is a little bit hit and miss. What do I mean by that? Um, how often does a frost affect your business? How often does a flood? Is it, oh, I think it's every five years? Well, actually it's every three, which is not twice in 10, it's three times in 10, which is also, you know, seven in 20. So having a think about the actual uh, impacts and likelihood of these events from um, without taking, with taking the hearsay um, out of it. So how often has the market dropped? How often has rain at the wrong time or rain at the right time or rain at the, uh, or no rain impacted your business across the period of your ownership? Um, and if it isn't, if there's some records beyond that or if it's multi-generational, even a purchase established business, um, is, is there any information that you can get from your own business, from your community, or from your industry, um, and seek some input for, input from others to make sure you've got a handle. Because the past is the best indicator of the future, which is a pretty scary reality, um, especially at the moment. But it's all we have to go by. Um, we can dream all our we like, but without taking that knowledge with us, we put ourselves in quite a vulnerable situation. And also, if it's happened before, it can happen again. But how often does it happen? So have a really good think about um, those critical um, aspects of your business, what impacts them, but also having a look at, um, at, at what has happened in the past and starting to build this picture um, of what risk, risks have impacted in your business. Then those critical um, elements of your business, ask yourself, what would happen if it was gone? What would happen if my business changed to the point where it was affected to the point where that element, that activity, that person, that um, uh, it might be that resource, that asset is gone? And have a think about if you can't live without it. And if you can't, if the impact is going to be so significant, it's some of those things that we actually need to start um, managing and looking after and having a system and um, a strategy in place. Because if 
the risk of that is high enough that it would impact our business very significantly. Absolutely, it needs to be to be managed. Um, but also then having a look at the processes that do exist in your business and seeing if they're, uh, if they're sufficient enough. Are they adequate enough to um, help you, um, you know, get by if these, um, these risks do occur? So let's have a think about some of the risks that do, um, I guess, systematically, usually, could affect farming businesses. Um, we have first um, that economic risk, which is uh, anything that will impact the profitability or financial viability of your business. It could be interest rates, it could be a recession. Um, we're going to talk about market risks um, uh, independently, but if anything that um, you know really does impact the economic viability of your business. And the question is how, in, how sensitive is your particular industry um, or your business to that economic viability? And what is it that you can do to um, manage or mitigate it? Then um, production risk is another big one. So how efficient is your system? We talked about cost of production and, and um, improving your gross margin. Um, uh, do you operate in a space of competitive cost production? But also what else can impact the viability of um, the enterprise? Is it disease? Is it nutrition? Um, is it, could it be wiped out by something um, you know, either exotic or quite common? And if so, how often does it happen and what is the, the impact? So have a think about your production system and what risks could um, impact um, that production system and what strategies you could put in place to mitigate them. And a lot of this stuff we do anyway. It's where it might be, um, you know, it might be animal health measures. It might be agronomic measures that you put in place to um, manage your production risk already. Um, if we keep going down market risk, which again, um, is a little bit separate to financial viability, but can really have an impact on, on the bottom line. How sensitive um, is, is the enterprise to market risk? But also there's lots of opportunity between uh, forward selling, um, you know, trading. What is it that you can do to manage your market risk? Is it around relationships? Is it diversity? Um, you know, what is it that uh, correct um, advice, making sure that um, you've got the intel you need to make the appropriate decisions to mitigate against that market risk. Climate risk, we talked about um, the impact of a drought. Um, what is it that um, impacts your business significantly and is there anything you can do about it? So um, the variability and reliability of your climate can obviously really do some damage to your bottom line and also be your greatest um, ally. Is it frost, is it rainfall, is it drought, is it flood? Um, and how often do these things really happen? And how bad are they when they do happen? And is there anything that you can do to prepare um, or to manage those risks when they do occur? Um, then we've got environmental risks. There's a couple of different um, examples there. We've got those um, internal environmental risks, which are things that, um, the concerns that could be uh, constraining in your local environment. We are talking here about salinity, sedicity, erosion, could be woody weeds. So, and potentially some of this stuff, um, we're here on behalf of uh, Northwest Local Land Services. So some of this stuff, um, I'm sure mitigating and managing environmental uh, and natural asset risk would be something that um, they would love to have a conversation with you about. Um, uh, additionally to that, we have ex uh, external environmental risk, which could come in the form of um, government restraints or changes of legislation. So where it might be changing land use or um, you know, changing regulations that impact your um, ability to manage your local environment. We also have in there um, that uh, demographic and geographic risk, we, they could possibly and probably should be um, separated, but we are again looking at our natural asset base there. So um, both the natural capacity of your uh, your land, your holding, and its sustainability, which we don't want to uh, mitigate the sustainability of um, of our natural assets, but also the um, geographic um, risk that occur. Is it proximity to markets? Is it uh, a reoccurring um, climatic concern that is uh, localized to your um, your region? So, what are the um, the demographic and geographic risks that could impact your business? And is there anything that you can do to, um, to manage those? Um, the human risks. Um, so where we um, look at human risks, we can talk about is there key pers uh, personnel in our, uh, in our business that if they were to leave um, or they left uh, without us knowing, what would the impact be? 
What about service personnel? Do we have backup plans? Do we have enough um, support and resources in our team to get the job done? I always um, look here too at that intellectual capacity um, of, and, and value of our businesses. And I often see it in farming businesses where, yeah, absolutely, the intel is incredible, but it's in someone's head. So if that person became unavailable to you, and it might be back towards understanding, um, you know, production efficiency. It might be, um, yeah, we don't really need to worry about our climatic risk. Pop's got them sorted. He's right on to, you know, the forecast and the his historical record. So what happens if Pop's not there? So um, keep in mind that we can't, if we don't have access to this information, it's not valuable to us. We can also re-include there the, um, that concept of ensuring that conversation is open in forthcoming around people's goals and aspirations in the business. So we can prepare if someone is interested in exiting um, the business, especially a key decision maker or someone exiting the business that could uh, cost our business a lot of money. So um, yeah, so there's some examples there. And I don't know if anyone wants to put in the chat box if I've missed anything. Is there anything else, any other risks uh, in your business that you um, you currently um, manage? I would have suggest, uh, suggested that uh, a pandemic is not necessarily something that you would have expected um, to be to be dealing with. Um, and fortunately, of all industries, I'm thinking that agriculture is one of the few, um, you know, we, we could be impacted less than a lot of other businesses. I'm happy to um, take that comment back if you don't agree, but I'm pleased to be in agriculture and not hospitality or the arts. So, um, you know, but it's an example of a, a risk that wasn't foreseeable and we would have never put pandemic um, on um, our on our risk radar um, if you're running a cafe in a region. So um, it, it is crazy. But what we can put on our risk register are the things that we actually, you know, chances are they're going to happen. So really important that we've got a handle on what the risks are in our business and what strategies, um, and then we can start looking at the strategies um, that we can put in place to manage, and manage those. So, if we um, were to look at um, the risks in our business, um, what is the impact of those risks? So is it on longevity? So uh, is it a long-term risk or is it affecting the, our ability to continue to do business? Is it on our sustainability? Is it impacting our natural assets and our, our resource base? Um, or is it our profitability? Because at the end of the day, we, you know, sustainability and longevity is one thing, as long as we're at least slightly in the black. Um, but also allowing these risks to um, frame up your decisions. So um, we're going, we've talked about decision um, making based on our values, but also on in our goal and our overall vision and mission. Well, now we've got another piece to our pie. It's really important that the risks that, our, that can impact on our business aren't disregarded when we're making these decisions. So how can we use this information to ensure that our businesses are in line with um, the capacity of our business. If you want to make a risky decision um, and it's not necessarily uh, governed by uh, fact and we have a low tolerance, we're really putting ourselves and our business and our livelihoods um, into some pretty dangerous sort of territory. So allowing um, the perceived uh, and calculated risks and potential risks that would impact our business to um, frame up and shape our decisions and our actions is actually really smart business. Um, but also the next question there is, um, is understanding what our strategies we can put in place um, to mitigate, mitigate our risk. The last piece of the plan I'm going to talk about this um, in a moment is um, the appetite of the individual in our business to, uh, to tolerate risk. So do you share the same um, risk appetite? So um, once we know um, the uh, likelihood of a risk, then we can potentially uh, look at the severity of the impact. And I'm sure most people would have seen a table like this, so a risk um, assessment table. We have to ask ourselves two things here. It's pretty straightforward. What is the likelihood? So that's down this column, um, but then also what is the consequence? So if it's really likely to happen, um, but it's really an insignificant sort of outcome and it's not really going to um, impact us greatly, well, at that point, we can really leave it, really. Um, but if we get into a territory where it is likely to happen and the outcome is going to be critical, and look, the time period in this preparation might just be 
three days, it might be that there's a flood coming, a fire coming, we might get a heads up that there is going to be a market crash or that you've got an infestation of an exotic disease and you've got a very short window to, um, to engage your risk plan. So, or it might be that there's some risk that you manage in your business that, you know, that's, um, the impact is quite high, the assessment um, result is quite high. So, you know, these are some of the things that we could possibly put some strategies in place. If there is gonna be some significant consequences, then it's possible or likely, um, this is where we'd put our attention, definitely. We'd be hoping we can mitigate these risks to the point where we can um, be managing them. But you'd also be making sure you've got some attention in here as well. So um, how can we manage our risk? First and foremost is, um, is knowing what they are. So I gave that big long list and I talked about how you can assess your business um, and have a look at it critically. Use some of the statistics and results um, and information from your your own business, your community, your industry, um, to put together um, a really clear picture of what some of the risks could be. Um, and then we're going to make sure that we're um, accessing some records um, from wherever they might be your own, hopefully they're your own going forward, they could be your own, uh, but again, uh, isn't out of your local area your, or the industry group that you're involved with or the enterprise group you're involved with, um, that you can find some records to really determine if your, um, your judgment of the likelihood and severity of the risk um, is not cloudy and that it is actually clear and you're not sort of, I, I don't really give a lot of attention to that because it never happens. Well, it actually happens every couple of years. So having a think about what information you can use to make sure um, that you are well informed um, as to the requirement to manage the risk. And that comes back to that continuous improved knowledge um, and understanding of the facts. So, got back to fallacy here and depending on your risk um, tolerance as an individual, whether or not you let the facts get in the, in the way of your fantasy, which is really where it's at, where you can sort of justify some facts that aren't in line with your uh, your goal or your tolerance to uh, might be to take a risk. So, um, but also here, making sure we're understanding if there's any obligations, it might be legislative obligations, it might be obligations to others um, in your business or obligations um, to the business itself. Um, and making sure that we're managing the risk to ensure we can meet those obligations. Um, and then again, allowing ourselves, if our tolerance, um, our capacity rather is high enough in our business to materialise an opportunity because usually risky situations, they, they can definitely go against us, but they can also result in um, you know, a, a bounce forward as well for our business. Um, we talked in the last uh, webinar as well about the requirement to have a plan and then also the requirement to stick to the said plan. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, now, just quickly, I'm conscious that um, I want to leave some time for Keith and the team to talk about how they can help you manage your risk at the end. But um, I want to uh, talk about uh, strategies to manage risk. So um, there's a few things that you can put in place and similarly we've, we've touched on some of this stuff. but um, making sure that our cost structure and the efficiencies in our business um, are reasonable. So if we can head towards a lower cost structure, including a low cost of production, um, so your business can potentially sustain any impact of production risk or um, a downturn in the markets. Um, also making sure that diverse income um, stream is there, so buffer periods for low, um, low prices in one particular enterprise. Um, and then also, um, as an alternative to diversification of the enterprise, you could potentially look for some off um, property income sources, which don't get me wrong, when reserves are low, equity is low, some of this stuff is a bit difficult to achieve. And similarly, uh, financial re reserves, such as a, a farm, um, FMG farm management deposits, um, may be a nice way to be prepared, more prepared for periods of drought or low prices or changes in the business environment. Um, we mentioned insurance and look, insurances are a financial tool to, um, to manage um, to manage risk uh, where you can um, pay, obviously pay a premium and allow someone to um, offset the financial impact if the risk was to occur. Um, they, yeah, and it also could be used to, like it might be commodity price variation or uh, impact of a, a catastrophic risk such as a fire or flood or um, I'm yet to see drought insurance. But, um, but the other thing is we can make sure we have management systems in place to manage our production risks. So making sure um, our production system is well designed, it's well maintained, 
Uh, it's flexible for good and bad seasons um, and it incorporates a management calendar. So you can actually manage and measure exactly what's um, going on and ensure things like you know, whether it's agronomic activity, um, animal husbandry, whatever it needs to be is adequate to offset um, uh, the risk that um, could impact on your business. Then that last um, piece there is around um, e equity. And obviously the higher the equity, the more tolerant your business um, will be to risk. Um, there is always that extra piece to the puzzle that's never as simple as it seems. Um, I um, am really conscious that I see this happen all the time when I work in strategic planning and farming businesses. Uh, we have businesses where the risk tolerance of the decision makers, and I'm going to talk to you, it might be father or son, it might be husband and wife, can be quite different. There are three types of uh, risk attitudes or risk tolerances. Um, there's people who are risk adverse. So they're people who are quite conservative, um, they don't necessarily expect the big gains, but also will manage against big losses. So we, there's a lovely consistency in those individuals. But people who are a bit more, not quite as conservative, but also not quite as risky, that sort of neutral ground. And then we have people, and I see lots of times in farming businesses, the risk-seeking individuals where they can see an opportunity. The potential detriment is quite low, uh, is quite high, but also the potential reward is quite high as well. So I'm gonna talk about the interaction of different um, risk tolerances in a team and also then the impact of that on the risk capacity um, and the interaction with your business. So um, it isn't necessarily as simple as putting yourself into a box. And here's a few reasons how your risk um, tolerance or your risk attitude can be impacted. And we saw this come to the fore during the drought where people, um, the, the stress and the fatigue had set in and people's tolerance of risk was either like, we just have to survive or you know what, we've got nothing to lose. We might as well go all out and if it doesn't rain, we're in trouble. Um, but also that personality type, are we big picture people? Are we detail focused people? Are we people that will ignore the facts at any cost or won't necessarily crunch the numbers effectively if it means that you're not going to be able to materialise an opportunity? Again, um, life experience will impact this and someone might have had an adverse um, uh, experience with a particular enterprise or it might be an event, a climatic event, and as a result, they either are very risky um, in that area and will, will jump at every opportunity because any opportunity has materialised or where they've been adversely affected and as a result they can have quite a bias. There are a few things that you can do to make sure that um, or to manage that risk tolerance in your business especially when it's different. So when I say when it's different if you've got um, conflict in your business where someone loves a good risk and someone loves the consolidation and conservative approach we can see um, you often see conflict. Um, making sure that we're all brought into the same on the same bus, on the same road, you know our goal, that all of our goals are, um, are similar, um, that our core values are held at the outset. So what is it that you're trying to achieve and with what guide rails? If it is um, sustainability, what is the impact of this risk on our sustainability? Is it on um, profitability, efficiency? Uh, but also I'm gonna suggest in here that um, respect and integrity are probably some values too. So making sure that those values are framing your decision even towards risk as well. And when I say respect and integrity, it might be that you know everyone has to come down off their posts and leave in the middle. So while someone might be always the naysayer and someone's always the one taking the risk, how about we have a bit of an acknowledgement for um, the different individuals in the business. Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to um, decent solid communication is the justification of why or the justification of absolutely why not. So why is it important to one individual and maybe not to the other? And what are the fears and concerns? Bring the facts to the table and pitch the fantasy. So if it was to lay out and you weren't emotionally involved and attached, what would it look like? Um, but then if we've got some sound logical decision-making, we can make sure we're on the same bus because sometimes we see a decision made, not everyone's happy with it. And the minute it doesn't go the way that we, the decision maker was hoping, it's quick for the other party to say, see, told you we shouldn't have bought the neighbour C, told you we shouldn't have bought it, bought, um, no, that life, those livestock, we shouldn't have planted the crop, we shouldn't have you know, bought the shares. So um, we can create further conflict down the track if the um, decision doesn't go in line with the upside of the, of the risk and can cause some dramas that way. And also in this respect, there, there will be those biases. You know, I talked about 
um, uh, previous experience where someone has had some sort of negative or positive experience and it's biasing their decisions. So just to wrap up, I'm um, conscious we're headed towards um, closing time is they these two things interact. So this is where we have um, an interaction between risk capacity and that risk attitude or tolerance. So where we can get into some testing territory is if we've got people that um, are particularly daring and the capacity um, of the risk capacity of the business is low, we can end up with some, you know, pretty solid sort of concerns where people are making decisions and writing checks that their business can't cash, really. Um, that being said, we could have people that are particularly wary in a business where um, they have a really high risk tolerance and as a result, um, then they're missing opportunities. So they could have taken the opportunity, but they really um, weren't interested. So um, I put in the um, in the notes in the workbook an opportunity for you to have a think about the risk uh, capacity of your business, the risk tolerance of the individuals, and also what this means. So where we can see um, a lost opportunity or potential for concern is where we have a lower risk capacity and a high risk attitude, and it means that they're really um, those some of those decisions could potentially put the business under threat. Um, but then again, if we've got a really high risk capacity and a low attitude, it means that we might be taking appropriate risks um, and we could be missing out on the potential benefits. Um, so by way um, of a wrap up, um, we uh, need to understand what risks actually impact our business and then our business's um, uh, capacity to tolerate those risks. Have a think about um, what strategies you can put in place and then also um, the um, the decision makers risk tolerance and how this all comes together to ensure that um, any risk that could have a significant impact on your business are mitigated but also any risk that could have a potential benefit um, and mutual benefit across parties in the business are materialized. Um, I've taken uh, that's taken me to um, the end of the presentation um, in its uh, in the main form. I'm happy to take any questions at this point and I'm going to Finish on a comment before I hand back to uh, Keith. So I've got Keith on notice there because he wants to talk about um, some of the uh, projects and opportunities that exist with local land services. But it would be remiss of me to not mention a program that we are uh, we have just launched. As it was actually a part of Farm Safety Week last week, and I probably mentioned it last week as well. But one of the risks that do up is posed to business owners, farming business owners, uh, business owners generally, um, is that of work health and safety and um, outside delivering webinars on strategy, it's probably over 50% of the way of where we um, do business is in helping businesses work health and uh, do work health and safety. So if your business has an interest in improving its work, work health and safety and wants a one-stop shop to get it done, uh, and you across the course of these webinars have enjoyed the way that uh, we have presented, we've got a really special offer. Um, the program is $3,500 plus GST and there's a third $350 discount for attending this webinar. So um, with that, if there, um, if you want any information on that, um, our social media channels, it's all there, um, or give me a call, drop me an email. Um, but I'm happy as we hand over to, back to Keith. Um, Keith, uh, Leone, any questions come through on the chat box there? Uh, not necessarily. Um... Uh, Pip did ask um, if we want to help identify or fine-tune goals, strategies, etc. Is there someone in that role who can help us? Um, I have answered that just saying that it's probably best to bring um, a professional in if you have one. There's also maybe an opportunity to get your accountant, bank manager, business advisor, agronomist, um, livestock advisor together to um, discuss that as part of a team, like an advisory board. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have anything further to add to that, Beck. Look, um, uh, the only thing I would say, so we're doing some work with a business um, down at, near Spring Ridge at the moment where uh, we went in to do work health and safety in HR and in the end realised that we weren't actually on the same bus. So uh, an example, the only before we get into the um, nuts and bolts, I do encourage you to make sure that some of that front end um, of your business is sorted. So where we, um, yeah, when we're not hit, hit singing from the same hymn sheet, any amount of nuts and bolts, production plans, like you've said, make sure even your advisors are on the same page. And 
um, we're running a program, say for example, um, over in the McBay Valley around exactly that, which is, you know, we're doing it for Glen Rack as well, where, you know, and we do help a lot of individuals with that stuff. It's around business strategy. And um, with a pretty short period of time, you can do a check-in and make sure, and I love the analogy of the bus. So is everyone on the same bus? No one's letting the tyres down. No one's, you know, we're all on the same track with the same pressure in our tyres at the same rate with the same risk tolerance and the same values and goals and vision. So, and I do see in farming businesses, even fam small family farming businesses where that's not always the case. It makes me feeling sad. Um, yeah, so good question. Thanks. Um, um, Keith, yeah, okay. Awesome. Keith, are you right? Um, I can, um, here's a slide. Um, can I hand back over to you, Keith? Um, and a, a big thank you again for those who have listened in once, twice, or three times. I hope that what we've said has been, uh, been valuable, and we've certainly loved working with the local land services team on this sort of project. So thanks for having us. Um, and I'll hand back over to Keith to talk about where to from here with some support from local land services. Thanks, Pete. That's been a really good appraisal of risk management and how we can manage it and move our, our businesses forward um, in relation to handling our risk and building our, our enterprises. So following on from Beck's presentation, we'll just recap a little bit in terms of how our funding works. So we've got two streams of our funding, one being catchment management, a catch and action uh, New South Wales. Um, now that those projects will be funded till June 2021. Um, the Check Ready Grow program is part of the Catchment Action New South Wales program. The second funding stream that we've got is our National Land Care program, and that project funding goes to June 2023. So you've got a couple of different options for timeframes. Underneath the NLP, National Land Care Program, we've got Resilient Agriculture, Brigalow Woodlands, Ramsar Wetlands, and Regent Honey Eaters. So going on to our next slide, thank you. Um, what activities could be funded under these programs, these funding streams? So on the left hand side there, we've got the activity or the project. Um, and then working through that tabulation, you've got Check Ready Grow Regional Resilient Agriculture, which will be overseen by our agricultural advisory services and by our regional agricultural land care facilitators, who are Launa Andrews from Tamworth Regional Land Care Association and from Ann Coo, Northern Slopes Land Care Association. So both those two ladies do a power of work in organising farmer groups and those sorts of things, and they do a great job. Okay, and then we've got our Brigalow Woodland Condition, Regent Honey Eaters, and also the final category there is our Ramsar Woodland Condition. Now, if we were looking at uh, the region honey eaters, Leonie Coleman is the, uh, the lady to um, have a chat to about those projects. Uh, condition of Brigalow Woodlands is Pip Jones. There's Leonie. And Pip Jones. Yeah, you see is... <laughs> and um, Pip Jones is my colleague based here in Gundy. And Pip's absolutely um, wonderful with what she does in the field and in the office. And in fact, this last week, she's um, got onto um, a recording about how to fill out one of the application forms. So we'll put that up on the website and you can listen to Pip running through um, those uh, elements of the applications so that you can write uh, your application so that we've You've covered everything that we need for the assessment. And if you wish, um, we'll have folk that can come to your property and, and, and have a look at that project and see if it's, it's feasible under the, uh, the funding streams. So um, 
the regional, sorry, the resilient regional agriculture. Um, George Truman is a contact for that, and he's based in the Gunnedah office. And we've also got um, myself here up in um, in Gundawindi for the Check Ready Grow. Um, there is a fact sheet that we have on the the website, so I'd um, urge everyone to have a look at that, just as a bit of a run through about um, the different programs and what we can offer. There's also we've got a scorecard that's on the um, the web page as well. And what we've tried to do through this whole program is to align our natural assets and our business assets. So the scorecard is actually broken into two sections and that's, you'll see that up on the, on the website. And there's also a score summary sheet that goes with that as well. So if you, um, you go to the website, have a look at those. And what we've tried to do is look at our production assets and our natural assets and have a bit of a run through there as to what categories um, that your enterprise covers and how well you're scoring on what you're actually doing. It might be some planning or it might be um, weed management, those sorts of things. Now with the scorecard, if you can fill that scorecard out and send it in with an application, that will be really useful because that sort of benchmarks your enterprise as to how you see how things are working for you, both from a business context and from a natural resource management context. And once the project is also done in 12 months, in the case of Check Ready Grow, um, we'll relook at that scorecard and see what sort of things you've learned out, out of that project. So it's a bit of a benchmark for you prior to doing the project and after doing the project. Then the, um, the contracts themselves, they'll run for a period of 10 years. Um, the actual on-ground work component will run for 12 months under Check Ready Grow and up to 2023, potentially with the NLP. So, um, in that time, we'll do a completion report at the end of the 12 months for the on-ground project under catchment action. And then we'll monitor it five years and at 10 years. Now we're not gonna be out there every two months having a look at, at what's going on with the project. We, we do that five and that 10 years. And the, um, the project itself doesn't go on title. It's just working with us for that project. And once you finish one project and we sign it off, then you can move on to others. Use them as little stepping stones. And I've often said to people, start small with this stuff and build in to other bigger projects. And having the option of the grant funding can help you financially. It's a 50-50 um, a split. So 50% comes from Northwest Local Land Services and 50% from cash and in kind, and your in kind can be things like your plant hire, your labour, um, and that's put back into the equation. So um, don't be afraid to have a go at these things. And it's a competitive round for funding. And we're expecting that we'll have some really great applications this year, as we've, we've had previously. The assessment panel, which will be Sarah Chapman, Dale Kirby and Angela Baker, they'll be having a look at each of these projects. If you've got a Rikern fencing project, it'd be great to get your neighbours on board. There's a really good article coming out on the land um, about one of our projects. Um, the Upper Mukai Land Care Group is doing some fantastic stuff down there, um, covering a range of enterprises along a water course and looking at natural sequence farming and looking at um, grazing management. So those are the sorts of things that we're looking for under the, the check ready grow or catchment action side of things. Um, so certainly give us a call, happy to come and have a look and uh, have a listen to Pip's um, her video and have a crack at it and certainly um, 
keep the communication going with our teams. There's some great people in Northwest Local Land Services and we can bring expertise in for different aspects of your project. So really that's probably um, about all I have this afternoon and for our, our third webinar. We've, um, we've covered a lot of country um, with our business vision, mission and goals for webinar number one our um, business planning and goal setting, funding opportunities, webinar two. And then for today, we were looking at managing our risk and the role of our grant funding once again. So I'd certainly like to thank Beck for all the work that she's put into these webinars. Great presentations, lots of information. It's just been really, really good working with you once again for our second uh, Check Ready Grow Forum and certainly like to acknowledge all of the, the work that the Northwest Local Land Services team has done to get this webinar package to yourselves. And certainly um, for folk who have attended, registered, and are looking at further projects within our funding streams, thank you very much for your time. And I wish you all the very best, stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.